The 1980s have seen more of us travelling by air than ever before. Good times for travellers, but, ironically, bad times for the plane makers. The market for the old generation of high-cost, fuel-hungry jumbos is in the doldrums. This is the story of how they created a new kind of plane to capture the toughest market in the world. Britain's Farnborough Air Show has long been the marketplace for the best the world aviation industry has to offer. Sheer spectacle apart, it's an opportunity for serious buyers from all over the world to see on display every kind of civil or military aircraft. There's plenty of interest in small, short-haul planes like this, the business and executive jet with an eye to fuel economy. But the hard facts of a world recession have made selling aeroplanes harder work than ever before. The new trend is for risk-sharing projects like the Tornado. Britain, Germany and Italy cooperating to spread massive development costs. The buyers who come here to wheel and deal for their countries will only put their money into new planes that satisfy today's priorities. Fuel-efficient aircraft like the new Jetstream. Or another joint venture, the best-selling European Airbus. And Fandra was soon to cast its critical eye on another new challenger. conventional looking plane, yet the new 146 airliner represents one of the biggest bits of risk taking in aviation history. A 300 million pound gamble on the fact that no one has built a small commuter jet of this type for more than 20 years. But how does the industry set about creating the right plane? A new aircraft is no longer the brainchild of one inspired mind. Nowadays, it all starts in the most unromantic of places, the sales section. It's the marketing men who decide whether a new plane is born and what kind of plane it will be down to the most minute detail. They even invent their own imaginary airline on computer to simulate the way a real airline will operate, from the price of tickets to what goes on the menu. Two years of market research and a plane that exists on computer before it even gets to the drawing board. Now they know what kind of plane to design, but what it actually looks like will be determined not by aesthetics, but solely by considerations of cost and efficiency. A situation well appreciated by aerospace designer Bob Griggs. Having got to the configuration of the broad outline of the aeroplane, you then got to decide where you put the wing, whether it's going to be a high wing or a low wing, the tail plane, whether it's going to be a high tail plane or a low tail plane. And this really comes about by looking at the overall performance and the cost levels of the aeroplane. We put the wing in the most efficient aerodynamic and structural position to suit the particular airline. The aesthetics of the aeroplane don't come into it at all. The only areas of the aeroplane that are not essentially functional are those areas which the passenger sees. All of the interior of the aeroplane is very much stylized to meet a customer uh, aesthetic point of view rather than anything else. But the hardware on the aeroplane, the pieces of the aeroplane that do the work, they are purely fixed essentially on the job they have to do and to do that with the minimum amount of cost involved in doing it. Alongside the marketing and design stages, there's been continual research and aerodynamic testing of the components of the plane that must one day be subject to the rigours, not of wind tunnel or laboratory, 
but of flight itself. The search is always for a better, more efficient aircraft. Research like this has helped to produce a new kind of wing for the 146 that gives greater lift and helps cut down on fuel consumption. An undercarriage rig that will go into full landing routine for more than 50,000 laboratory landings. Most airliner wings double as fuel tanks, 2,500 gallons full before each flight. So models of the real thing must be thoroughly tested for balance and safety factors in every angle of flight. Three years after the first designs, a complete plane made of wood. Not a designer's indulgence, but an essential part of pre-production testing. It's the most foolproof method yet devised to check out exactly how everything will or won't work before the real plane is built. At this mock-up stage, even chief test pilot Mike Goodfellow is pulled in to look for gremlins. As you know, I've recently been assessing the rudder pedal geometry in the mock-up. Mm -hmm. And uh, going through the motions on the mock-up has shown up a small but important problem on the pilot rudder pedal. Just one of a million details to be got right before the final assembly. Catch on the floor, and this could lead to uh, an inadvertent application of asymmetric brake. Every modification is fed into the computer. Twenty years ago, an alteration like that would have meant a whole new set of drawings. Now, it's just a matter of typing in the correction. The computer does the work of 50 people in a tenth of the time. When it's all stored on tape, the final design is transferred to another computer in the machine shop. Huge chunks of a plane carved into shape by remote control. From the cutting shop to the intricate business of assembling and testing more than 20,000 separate bits of the 146 structure. It's like putting together a complicated jigsaw, but in this case, with some of the pieces scattered right across the world. The wings for the 146 come from Nashville, USA. It's yet another example of the growth of international cooperation. British Aerospace has carried the bulk of the development costs, but with millions of pounds at stake, the days are long gone when a single company or nation could carry the whole burden alone. Wings and engine both come from America, the nose and main fuselage from Britain, and the tailplane from Sweden. It may sound complicated, but in fact, drawing on the specialist skills of existing production centers makes good business sense. Everything finally comes together at British Aerospace in England. In hangars that have seen great planes of the past, from wartime mosquitoes to the world's first jet airliner, the delicate process of piecing the international jigsaw together. Four Avco turbofan engines will power the 146. They're more fuel efficient, and they split into sections for easy checking and maintenance. Once again, the timing was crucial the right engine and the right technology coming together for a plane that has to convince people that this is what they want to buy. Thousands of individual skills and five years of planning and production to get the first plane off the assembly line. So, will the gods of Farnborough smile on the 146? First night nerves over. The sun shone, Farnborough was dazzled, and the 146, in brand new livery, had 12 orders on the books already. Its international godparents seem well pleased with their joint offspring. I think it will be the trend for the future because of the extreme costs that you have in developing such a device. And it's also very important to have several countries involved because each country brings along a piece of the market. And that piece of the market is important to the economic success of the airplane. 
For passengers on a typical intercity flight, the 146 will be about 10% cheaper than any of its predecessors. But these days, cost isn't the only consideration. Well, the real reason we went for it, the primary reason is on the side of the airplane. I think it's unbelievable that they've been able to pick such a uh, identification. Shh. Noise. Noise is the key to, to uh, this airplane's success. Uh, we, we serve California cities that are extremely sensitive to noise. To name a few, uh, Orange County, uh, another one Burbank, another one San Jose, and San Diego. These are all markets that we would plan on using this airplane in. And, for example, since we have committed to purchasing the airplane, we've had calls from the authorities of several of these airports asking us, won't we please come serve them? They're looking for us to come into it, and it's unheard of. These uh, particular airports that I just named are so critical that it's extremely difficult for new entries even to operate present equipment into it. Thirty-five percent of all the scheduled flights we take are in small aircraft like this, and it's a rising market. The 70 to 100 seaters that hop from country to country, for bus stop jets for intercity commuting, or for countries where there simply is no other viable form of transport. For the 146, it looks as though the gamble may have just paid off. Oh, you'll sell uh, many hundreds of these uh, aircraft, and uh, you and I will be thinking about retirement before this uh, aircraft goes out of uh, production. I believe you're going to see that this is a workhorse airplane. It looks like a workhorse airplane. It's a rugged airplane. And you're going to be producing it for a long period of time. Nobody will ever have the money to develop another airplane like it. So I, I think it's, uh, you're there at the right time, and it's going to go for a long time. civil defense.